Hello, and welcome to the Signpost Inn podcast, a space at life's crossroads to connect with God and find direction. Pour yourself a drink, grab a seat, and join us on the back porch for a friendly conversation about Christian prayer, spirituality, and faithful theology. My name's Matt. And I'm Brandon, and we're really glad you're here. The Signpost Inn podcast is brought to you by the Signpost Inn ministry, where we offer spiritual direction, retreats and sabbatical residencies, and lots of resources and training. You can find out more about what we do and support us by visiting signpostin.org. Hey everyone, I'm sure you've heard of Black Friday and Cyber Monday, where we all shop for great deals on Christmas gifts, but have you ever heard of Giving Tuesday? It's on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, and during this time of year when we spend so much on gifts, Giving Tuesday is a way to celebrate that generosity and that hospitality by giving a gift to your favorite charity. And this month, we want to be your favorite charity. You know people who feel exhausted and alone, people who are burned out or deconstructing. You also know people who are vibrant and growing and are just looking for like-minded Christians to support them. And you want to help them. So do we. Like you, we're passionate about throwing open our doors and welcoming people. We create spaces, literally in our office, at retreats, or in our homes, and metaphorically through our resources like this podcast, where people can rest and reconnect with God. Through the incarnate grace of hospitality, we help people to pray and grow in biblically faithful ways. So this giving season, your donation to our ministry will help us keep our door open. So as you're shopping for that next great Black Friday deal, please keep up us in mind too. What better gift can you give than the gift of welcome and connection with God? To donate, please visit signpostin.org slash donate, and please give generously. Your gift will change the way someone relates to God forever. So my guest today is Dr. Thomas Kimber, and Dr. Kimber is the Dean of Faculty, the Director of Research, and a lecturer in the missional and pastoral theology at the Melbourne School of Theology. Originally from Southern California, Dr. Kimber has served in a number of ministry positions as a writer, editor, teacher, and mentor. He and his wife, Sue, have served as missionaries in China for nine years and have also served as missionaries throughout Asia, Eastern Europe, and Africa. He earned his PhD from the Talbot School of Theology, and his areas of research include the integration of spiritual formation and pastoral theology, and mission. And he's written several publications and presentations, including one, Dr. Kimmer, that especially caught my eye, which is what we were just talking about, which was the transformation through contemplation, the formation of identity through the gaze of the soul. And that one especially caught my eye simply because I'm doing this series of interviews with people on the idea of contemplation. And that's not something I've gotten into much yet, is this idea of how Christian contemplation is a part of transformation of our soul or development. So I'd love to let you go there. I would also eventually, maybe we'll work our way back to kind of what you think about what contemplation is and et cetera, but maybe this is the way to get into it. Yeah, tell me more about that. How does contemplation work into identity and formation? Yeah, it's a great question. And thanks for the opportunity to, to be with you and to, to talk about these things of mutual importance and interest to, to both of us. The whole idea of identity formation is, it's an important topic within the realm of spirituality, spiritual formation. Those are large umbrella terms for what's going on in this, this work that God is doing in each of us, forming us more into the image of Christ. And the idea of identity formation is so central to all of that. And I think it's important to understand that identities aren't necessarily things that are just handed to us. There are certain things that form our sense of identity that we don't have a whole lot of control over. Where I was born, I didn't have any say in that, you know, so that gives me a certain national and ethnic identity and those kinds of things. So some things are there, but the reality is that identities are also nurtured, that we we participate in that formation of identity. Identities are constructed in relationships. And so through the nurturing of relationships, in fact, some people would say that identities are co-created in relationships. 
And so there are certain identities, and we all have multiple identities, but there are some that we nurture more than others. You've identified the fact that I live in Australia, but I'm from Southern California, and that gives me a certain identity in a context like this, a national identity, an ethnic identity. And to what extent do I nurture my identity as an American while I live overseas? Well, the reality is I don't do a whole lot to nurture that sense of identity. Why? It's not as important to me as other identities. So when scripture talks about my true identity, my identity in Christ, that is what we would understand as a core identity, an identity around which all my other identities are formed. And so for me, the, the, the question is, what does it mean to be a person in Christ and to nurture that sense of identity? If this is truly what scripture says is true of me, well, how do I nurture that? I'm a husband. I'm a father. What does it mean to be a husband in Christ? What does it mean to be a father in Christ? What does it mean to live my ethnic and my national cultural identity in Christ? And so that sense of in Christness, my identity as God sees me, becomes the, the core of how I see myself. Mm. So identities are nurtured. I nurture that sense of identity through the practice of spiritual disciplines, through these practices have, that have been a part of the church for centuries. When I sit down to pray, and that nurtures a sense of identity in me. When I gather with the people of God in worship, that's why I think the writer of Hebrew says, don't neglect the gathering together because it is a part of what forms my collective sense of identity as a part of a community, a community of people who identify as, as believers. And so identities are, are nurtured. They're, they are formed through these practices. So that's where we come into that particular article that I wrote, which became a chapter in a book, the sense of contemplation specifically as a spiritual practice, which gives my soul a certain shape, gives it a certain form. Mm -hmm. it, it nurtures that true sense of who I really am as, as God sees me, as I want to see myself more and more. The idea of, of contemplation as a spiritual practice with the, the idea of liturgies and drawing on how liturgy forms us and shapes us. And this, this idea of contemplation becomes a form of liturgy. Sitting in silence and solitude is liturgical practices, a, a practice that, that defines ultimately who I am and my, my bigger story of, of, of what I'm all about. Can you unpack that idea for me a little bit? Like, how is how is the spiritual practice of contemplation a liturgy? What does that mean? Yeah, liturgy. James K. A. Smith in his in his book Desiring the Kingdom and and You Are What You Love this this idea that liturgies connect us with the ultimate story of what mm. what we are all about, what life is all about, why were we created, and what is the ultimate story that we are a part of. And so he uses liturgy in that particular type of a way, and he says that, that society is filled with liturgies that are forming us and shaping us into certain kinds of people and are we paying attention to those things a lot of us are engaging in these liturgical practices you know trish harrison warren did a great great job in just talking about the liturgy of the ordinary and how these these routine practices shape us and form us into certain kinds of people. And so this is kind of an interesting, more contemporary understanding of liturgy. And even if we go back into the church and, and understanding the, the structure of the 
liturgical practice in worship, what is it doing? The whole essence of the liturgy is to remind us of our essential identity. The whole structure of the liturgy moves us to the, to the Eucharist, which again is this reminder, this is who I truly am. This is my, my essential identity in Christ, and that's why it's the high point. So baptism and communion become essential to the understanding of the liturgy and the church and the structure of the mass. And so liturgies form us and shape us into certain ways. And at the, at the essence of that is, is an understanding of my identity. And so it's, it's all really focused that way. Contemplation, as, as it is often described, is the gaze of the soul on the beauty of God. It is this constant posture of the soul looking at, listening to, engaging with in affective ways on, on the beauty of God, restoring that relationship between the creator and the creature, the, that natural relationship which, which he desires and which, which hopefully we're desiring as well. It's all about the renewal of this identity that has been broken and is now being restored through that essential relationship with God. There, There's a lot there. Wow. So I guess, help me, correct me if I'm misunderstanding this. What I'm hearing is something like contemplation is rudimentary understanding of it for right now. What you're saying is, as I take time to gaze on God, listen to God, mm-hmm that can be a liturgical kind of practice. And I'm connecting that in my mind to my actual liturgical practices that I do on Sunday mornings, where it's, I am responding. There's a call and response kind of thing happening. I'm responding to God doing things. And a previous interview I had, there was a very similar connection made that, that the response of the liturgy calls from me is to gaze on it. Here's what God did. And that's, that's what I'm hearing the connection to the Eucharist. It's to the Lord's supper. Here's the Lord partake, gaze, receive. Mm -hmm. And that then, I guess the connection I'm trying to understand and make to identity is maybe that's where I need your help. (laughs) How does that, how does that help me nurture my identity? Because it helps me to remember that I am the beloved. Can I have you unpack that a little bit? How does that help me nurture my identity? Let's remember that identities are shaped in relationship. Mm. Let's go back into Genesis chapter three. What is the first thing, the first experience when Adam and Eve sin? It's a broken relationship. Mm. And so they are, but let's understand too that all relationships have been broken. We put a lot of emphasis on the one relationship between me and God. And that's, that's good but that's only one of four relationships that I have and only one of four relationships that has been broken. So with those broken relationships is a loss of identity. If identity is created in relationship and all of those relationships are broken, what does that do to the formation of my identity? My identity is broken. My identity is misunderstood. It's misconstrued. It's I'm beginning to try and find identity in other things. And And so if, yeah. And the four relationships are me and God. Oh, yeah. So I have a relationship with God. And we often just focus on that one relationship when we're talking about spiritual formation, spirituality. It's my relationship with God. Get that right and everything's good. No, that's one of the four. I have a relationship with other people. So I live in a community and fundamentally that community is broken. And so there is the need to restore the relationships, whether they are my family relationship, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my son, the larger community that I'm a part of, my relationship with myself. I have a relationship with myself. That helps me to understand passages like Psalm 139, where where David is saying, Lord, you know me. 
But guess what? I don't know myself. I want to know myself. Help me know myself. And, and so I need you to help me understand me. And so part of spiritual formation in this renewal of identity is simply understanding who am I and why am I this way? You know, what is going on in me? And that is a, that's a lifelong process of just trying to understand who I am. But then I also have a relationship with the created world. And how, are, how am I relating properly to the world around me and all of creation? So I'm broke. My relationship with God is broken. My relationship with others is broken. My relationship with myself, my understanding of myself and my relationship with myself is broken. And my relationship with the world is broken, which means I don't know who I am with God. I don't know who I am with others. And I don't know who I am, period, with myself. And I don't know really how I fit into the created order. And so it sounds like where we're leading is something like contemplation. This spending time with God is like clearing my sight. It's a start. This is where all of those relationships begin, isn't it? So the essential relationship that needs to be restored is this relationship with God and how I relate to him. And not just intellectually, cognitively, but affectively. Um, God has given us five senses to explore the world and experience the world. And so often we are discouraged from exploring our relationship with God through all of our senses. And we, we focus only on the intellectual, cognitive ways of exploring. We study God, theology. I, I teach theology, which... I, I often joke with my students, you know, we have turned God into an ology, you know, something to be studied rather than a person to be enjoyed and experienced. And he has given us the capacity to actually relate to him as a person. And what we need to understand is how scripture portrays for us as a, a God who is relatable. We can talk to him. We can listen to him. We can taste and see that the Lord is good. I love the way John begins 1 John chapter 1. What we have seen with our eyes, what we have touched, and what we have held and beheld, all of these, yeah. it's so sensory. This is what I'm passing on to you. And so there is, and, and he says, so that your joy may be full. So there is, it's so visceral. It's so experiential. And how often are we really encouraged to enjoy and relate to God in that fuller sense? And so contemplation deals more with the affective experience of God rather than the cognitive experience of thinking about God and trying to figure him out and study him. It is truly enjoying him for who he is. And in that restoration of relationship, that is where my identity is put back together again, because it's, it's constructed in relationship, a loving relationship between me and God. And we begin to understand, why did God create me? What was I created for? And this restoration of relationship puts that back in the right order, the right place. Okay. Well, let me try to put some practical example to it to see if this helps me. Because one of the things you're saying that I is make, is drawing a connection for me, at least, is that contemplation is more of an affective thing, more of a sensory thing. It's dealing with my experience of God on those other levels, other than just my thinking about him. Cause often, you know, in modern day and age, we hear the word contemplation. It's like, think deep thoughts about God, mm. but you're moving it into this. No, no, have a maybe deep experience of God in many different mm. ways as if he's a real person, which he is. So the practical kind of connection I'm making is, <clears throat> how that helps me reform my identity is if I have a bad relationship with my wife, that really challenges my identity. I, if, if things are rough between me and my wife, I really start questioning what kind of a husband am I? Do I have some deep 
problems that I need to address, or even what kind of, you know, maybe, maybe I see the truth and she's got deep issues, which would, but all of that's in confusion. I don't really know in that relationship who I am to her. Whereas then when we can come back and have that evening where we can talk it out, we can have a glass of wine, we can sit on the back porch and things become calm again. Mm -hmm. Then it, a lot of those things get resolved. It's like clarity mm -hmm. happens. Oh, yeah, I was being selfish with that. Or or no, that actually was a problem that we need to deal with. But some I I I get that viscerally what it feels like to say who I am in this relationship has become restored. And I'm transferring that now to what you're saying with God. It's like I talk to people who I feel distant from God. All I ever do is think thoughts about him. That really makes me question, am I a good Christian? Why am I here? Maybe God doesn't care about me. Maybe God is the jerk here. Hmm. But what you're saying is contemplation. If I can get, I, I'm just asking now, if I start to have that more complete experience of him, I can have more restoration of, oh, I see where I stand. No, God, God loves me unconditionally. I start to see my, is that, am I getting onto it there? I kind of ran out of words there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me kind of help fill in the bigger picture. It's not that we have only an affective experience. We're going to move back into the cognitive side. We're going to show some connections here. One of the things that's really important in theological reflection is to pay attention to two things that are going on. First, this is where good evangelicals are, are really good on the one side, and that is our understanding of objective truth. And this is, this is where dogmatic theology, systematic theology, those kinds of things have a place. They're really important. There is an objective understanding of, of truth that we do need to grasp. Then we need to reflect on our own lives and say, okay, how am I experiencing this? What is going on in my life? The Bible tells me God is love. Okay, what does that look like in my daily practice? What does that look like in my experience? How does, how is God is love manifest in my daily experience of God? What does that what does that feel like? What does it sound like? What does it taste like? What does it mm. smell like? And so this is where, you know, you go into some of those Ignatian practices, which are just so rich and wonderful, the, the Ignatian practices of imagination and experiencing the world, and we can bring those things together. But the only thing that gives my subjective experience any meaning is its connection to objective truth. And so when I bring those two things together, God is love, and here's the story of my life, how do those connect or disconnect? This is where the lot, a lot of the Psalms of lament are so good because they say, yeah, you say you're love, but our life stinks. This is just, I don't feel loved right now. What the heck is going on right here? And I remember going through a season one time and I said to my wife, I came out of a time of prayer in my study and I just said, honey, why do I feel abandoned by God right now? And she just, you know, very wisely, she's a, she's a spiritual director. She had her spiritual director hat on. She said, mm -hmm. that's a place to sit, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and I sat in it for a while. And this is where we begin to say, there are these disconnects. How do I reconnect them? What is going on here? And this is where lament is a contemplative practice to say, God, okay, what is happening? Why do I feel so disconnected? Why, does this, why do I feel this dissonance between these two things? Well, Sometimes I need to have my understanding reoriented. Maybe my objective truth side of things is messed up and I need to have a, a, a reorientation there that makes sense with my experience. And sometimes I need to look at my experience and say, you know, so it goes back and forth. It goes, it goes mm -hmm. both directions. Yeah. That, that seems so relevant 
for me personally to a recent conversation I had and one that's kind of recurring. I've had many people express and myself have experienced this exactly that. I know God is love. That's what I, I can write the essay perfectly. I don't feel like God is love Hmm. or I don't feel like he loves me. And there's a, for many people I know, that's a great source of guilt and shame. Sure. I should feel like God loves me, but I don't. Mm -hmm. And at least, and actually that this part of the reason this series on contemplation has started is because one of the ways that I resolved that cognitive, that cognitive dissonance, that internal pain that I had was through the spiritual practice of centering prayer yeah because i learned to effectively surrender to the reality that i knew was true mm-hmm. and discovered that the should feel like god is love that's not a reality sometimes i don't that he loves me is an experience available to me though mm-hmm. that's the way i have resolved that in my own head so far yeah. You know, I, it's important, I think, to understand, too, we talk about contemplative practices. We could even venture into mystical theology, which is completely misunderstood, I think. Do we even want to go there? But, but the important thing to keep in mind for somebody in explaining, just talking about contemplation and contemplative practices as a contemplative myself, it's just my natural bent. It's just how I live my life. It, it isn't that I am pursuing contemplative practices. It's not that I'm pursuing mysticism. You know, if we look at the even the mystics and the contemplatives in history, they're not pursuing the practice. They're pursuing God. Mm. And the practice becomes a means to a much greater end. What am I hoping for in all of this? It's this restoration of this broken relationship that it takes, yes, it's restored, but we continue to grow and deepen in our relationships with one another. And so the rest, the restoration of my relationship with God now gives me the means to restore all those other relationships that are broken as well. And so it is the restoration of my relationship with myself. This is why the, we, we have these, the, these ongoing lifelong practices of continuing to discover who I am. You know, here I am, I'm in my mid sixties and making sense out of things that happened to me when I was 10 years old. Hmm. And finally, you know, you get a sense, oh, this is, there's, here's another layer of meaning that, that comes out of that. And why am I responding the way I am? And I thought I was over that, but I'm not, but there's always more healing to be done. There's always more growth to be done. And so the, those relationships are restored as well, every single one of them. So it's coming to an, a deeper understanding of who I am and how God created me and why he created me this way and how I'm experiencing and growing in those things and discovering more and more all the time. Contemplate At the heart of contemplation, I think, Brandon, that it, what's so important here, you talk about centering prayer. At the heart of contemplation is a soul that sits in stillness and silence with God, open, receptive, and simply enjoying the presence of God. This is where our human relationships can help us understand what's going on in that that kind of a practice we we put a lot of emphasis on words in prayer you know we we have verbal prayers and and we wait for a word from god you know those kinds of things but even in human communication we have nonverbal communications and we we look to see what kind of a response am I going to get? A look of the face, you know, what's the body posture like, you know, those kinds of things. We have nonverbal ways of communicating as well. And sometimes when my wife and I are just walking along, we don't have to say anything. 
But when we walk along hand in hand, you feel that person next to you, or you sit across a table enjoying a nice meal, and you just gaze across the table and look at each other. And it's like, I don't want to wreck this moment with a word. Or when you're singing together, or when you're praying together, or when you're just in one another's presence, there's a lot that happens there. Well, you know, we can do the same thing with God. We can sit with him. We can walk with him. We can simply enjoy one another's presence without a single word passing between us. And contemplation gives us that place of expanding our experience and relational capacity with him in in those kinds of ways centering prayer is often how i begin my times in prayer and it's just a good place to silence my soul to receive whatever he wants to give me we have to realize too that there there is a knowing beyond words and if we have to wait for a word all the time, we're limiting ourselves way too much. Sometimes I just know. How do you know that? Well, Paul says in Romans 8, 16, that the spirit bears witness with my spirit. And that can be in words, images, feelings, emotions, or just that smile across the room. And my wife looks at me, which I could just cry. I could cry just thinking about that right now. But that's, that's where contemplation is richer and fuller and sometimes words wreck it. Yeah. Pause for a moment to thank you for being willing to just kind of circle around a topic with me. This, I hope the people listening are going to benefit from my kind of sporadic questioning <laughs> but i really this for me is connecting some really big things given what you just said i confess like what one of the questions that arises in me i think is still from kind of my old my old training which says man he sounds that sounds good but how does he know it's God? How does it, how is that not just, you know, you, I mean, could, couldn't you hear God say anything or are you just emptying your mind? And you know, that's the kind of the, the challenge question that arises in me is all right, I'm scared now. <laughs> hmm. How do you not become new age? How do you not become open to things that Basically, how do I know it's God if I don't have really clear, strict, regular rules yeah. to tell me how to do this? <laughs> hmm. You know, this is where this is where we grow in relationship. Hmm. Over time, you think about your relationship with your wife. You can anticipate, oh, this is what she's gonna. This is what she's thinking. This is what she's going to say. Or when somebody reports back to you and says, oh, your wife says this, and you think, that doesn't sound like my wife. She would never say that. I've never heard her say that. Mm -hmm. And this is where scripture is helpful because God reveals what he's like. God reveals to us enough about himself that we can say, Oh, that doesn't sound like God, because we can test it. Mm -hmm. We get to know him so well that we can test these things. Mm -hmm. This is where discernment is helpful in, in relationship with other people. I'll talk with my spiritual director and say, what do you think about this? And he'll say, hmm, that's, you know, we need to, we need to reflect on that together. I, I have other spiritual companions and i'll say this came up you know let's let's reflect on this together and so the the reflection in community with other people you know god's spirit bears witness with our spirit and the more we get to know one another 
the more familiar that voice becomes. And, but then also, to be honest, over time, does it bear out? It's, it's one of those things when you get those, those senses from God, there is a sense of, okay, let's test this. And it's, and you grow and this is where, this is where Ignatian spirituality is. He, had, he talks a lot about discernment. How do we discern the voice of God? This is where meditation and contemplation can work so well together. You talk about some of the Eastern forms, you know, just emptying yourself and whatever comes in, you know, meditation has an object, typically scripture. There's scripture in there. And then the contemplation, the experience of God comes out of some kind. This is where that objective, subjective, again, work together. Mm. And, and so there is this back and forth that goes on there. So the, the discernment, the testing is a part of the experience of this which I think is important to do. I, I don't ever want to separate those two things, the objective and the subjective, mm -hmm. because God has objectively given us enough information about who he is and in the world itself so that we can test our subjective experience against something objectively true. Yeah. It, it strikes me that your, your answer has been a gentle form of sort of saying the question I asked comes from a place of immaturity. And it strikes me, I don't, maybe that's not what you're saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing that way in this way. It's mm -hmm. like, how do I know, how can I be sure that I don't be led astray and that I'm, I'm scared of what you're, you know, of contemplating God. And the answer is something like, you may need some, let me back up. You compared it to my relationship with my wife. And I distinctly remember being newly young married and I went to a lot of older men and said, give me some help here. Give me guy. And they would give me principles and they'd say, do this. Don't do this. I don't need those principles anymore. <laughs> I have a relationship with her where I, we've made our own rules to some extent. And if you were to ask me, how do, how do you have that? And I'm like, well, you grow. <laughs> I don't know. That may not be very helpful, but that's where I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> you know, you do, but it's a, but it's an individual process. God takes us through. But don't we all grow in our individual relationships with our wives, our kids, you know, yeah. other people? We grow in those. And that's a part of the, the, the maturing life in Christ, in, in God, is that we do grow in these things. And so you use the word immaturity that's not necessarily a negative term. We're all immature in some, in some area. Mm -hmm. And so I've been living this way for, you know, 60 years, but I still find myself in areas where I still need to grow. So I am still immature in some things and I grow in those things and I, I discover more. And so you're always moving from, from grace to grace, from immaturity to maturity, you know, and we're all in that process together. Yeah. I distinctly remember when going through some severe trauma in my life, I was introduced to this idea of silent prayer. And as I, I've alluded to, it's like my, my old training was scary. That's there lies danger. That's Christians that do that are, you know, are, are unmoored from the objective truth. But I was desperate enough. And God said, you need to spend time with me in silence without words. I was like, all right, I'll try anything. Yeah. And as I did it, I learned this is not really actually scary land. <laughs> there, there is treasure here. There's relationship here. There's depth here. And I look back on that previous experience to it. And it's like, well, yeah, I, I think I hear what you're saying. That wasn't a bad place for me to be. That's where God had me at that moment. But some of the fears that I hear expressed are just unfounded once you're in the reality of God is a real person and really relates to me. Mm -hmm. I think that might be how I'm understanding it now. Yeah, yeah. I think part of what brings that fear in 
is, and, and I think this does need to be addressed, there are abuses of mm -hmm. some of these practices. In the classes I teach, I teach a lot in spirituality and formation. And I assign practices to my students all the time. That's just a typical part of any class that I teach is that people are practicing spiritual disciplines. And there are two parts of that. When they write a reflection for me, do they really understand the practice? Do they really have an awareness of what this is, what it's intended to do? How does, what does scripture teach about prayer? What does it teach about meditation? What does it teach about retreat? You know, all these different practices. And now what was my experience of that? And so we, again, we're always going back to how do I understand it? And then how do I practice it? And I think what, where I hear a lot of the fear coming is we point to the abuses or the misuses of a practice and build a lot of our understanding based on a misunderstanding. And so if we can go back to what is the intended purpose of these things and what does scripture teach? Well, we see these things in, in scripture all over the place, God speaking to people mm -hmm. and people responding to him. But, but we become afraid because people have abused I got a word from the Lord and you're supposed to do this. I rarely get a word of, from the Lord about somebody else or telling some, telling my wife, my God told me you're supposed to do this. You know, <laughs> now usually he gives me a word for me and you know, I love, I love the, the wisdom that comes out of the desert fathers and you know, some of the, some of the, the very simple wisdom that comes out of them, things like I, I don't have to be worried about somebody else's problems. I have enough of my own and God can just take care of me in that place. And so I think when we begin to see the abuses of these things, that's where our fear comes, our misunderstanding of those things. But when we really understand the fullness of what prayer is, listening and speaking, silence and solitude, you know, those kinds of things, we can rest in those with with a greater sense of confidence god does speak have we developed the ability to listen and discern when he speaks and how he speaks and what that what that looks like and so yeah i think that's where some of those fears come from it's it's out of the abuses and the misuses rather than a a good understanding of of what these these things are it reminds me in college studying philosophy, my favorite professor began our one of our early classes with the principle that we were never allowed to judge a philosophy based on its misuse. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, the requirement of the class was to be open to what could you learn from this? It's, it's that mm -hmm. classic, put the best construction on it first, then you can come back and critique it. And that principle has just stood me in such good stead, even in this process yeah. of growing in prayer. It's never judge a practice based on its misuse. Like exactly. First understand what's good about it and what its original intent is. And more often than not, I've discovered, oh, this is a really good thing. And my understanding of all of it was it was filtered through all the abuses. And that's not this thing at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And when we understand that, you know, God has created all things, well, he created meditation. <laughs> what was his intention for it? God created contemplation. What was his intention for it? I'm in the midst of, of writing an article right now that is, is shaped around four questions. I realize that there are four questions that I ask in all of my, my teaching in spiritual formation. And, and I've never, I've never actually seen these questions, you know, in, in, in other ways. And so I thought, well, maybe I need to, to put this actually in writing and, and, and develop this and publish it. And the four questions, the first question is, what is spirituality? What are we talking about here? Spirituality, spiritual formation, what, what is this thing? You know, we need to understand 
how different people have defined. And that's not an easy thing to begin with is what is this? Second question is, what does it mean to be human? When God created us, what's the nature of original creation? And a part of that is what it means to be human. So do I really have an understanding of, of how God created me and what, what my capacities are as a human being? What does it mean to be in the image of God? These kinds of things. Third question is, what does it mean to be fallen? And I use the word fallenness very intentionally, not just sin, but fallen, because fallenness, I think, is a much larger concept. God created all things, but we live in this place of fallenness, which says that we are experiencing and engaging with things in, in a manner that is probably not fully what God intended for that. So meditation and contemplation and even prayer, all created by God for a specific purpose and intended to be experienced in a, in a particular way, we do experience that through the lens of fallenness. But then that leads us to the fourth question is, what does it mean to be redeemed? What does it mean to be restored? What is that picture of shalom that scripture paints for us, especially as we get to the end of Revelation, you know, that, that picture of restored life and all of that. So we're moving in that direction. And this is restoring that, as, as Ignatius says, the creature creator relationship as we're moving into this this ultimate place of, of glorification. And so, yeah, any of these things can be abused, misused, misunderstood, mm -hmm. but hopefully as we're moving into this place of restoration and restored relationship, it becomes clearer. It becomes, we, we begin to engage in the way that God originally intended for us to engage with that, that, res that restored relationship between the creature and the creator, having direct access to one another. Hopefully these things become more natural, clearer. It also becomes, and I think this is, this is where we begin to engage with what Paul talks about, prayer without ceasing that I don't slip in and out of these things. Hmm. It becomes the normal posture of my soul. And this is the way I live. So I, it's not that I have a set time of day when I contemplate. <laughs> I do those things, but what that does for me is it, postures me in such a way that it becomes the normal way that I live. I'm in a state of contemplation even now as we're talking. Mm -hmm. And that takes years of practice. You know, you begin with the Benedictine idea of seven times of prayer through the day. So you have a rhythm of pray and work and pray and work so that your prayer, your work begin to blend together. You can take it to the next place where there really isn't a separation between the two at all. You live in this state of prayer. And that's what that rhythm is intended to do is to, is, is to reshape the soul so that prayer becomes the central purpose for which I was created. And that restores my sense of identity. This is the life that God intends for me to live. A life of constant prayer, life lived in the presence of God at all times, whether I'm sitting in church or out in the field working, it doesn't matter. God is with me in all of that. And I grow in my sense of awareness of that presence. I think from my vantage point where I sit, so to speak, in this process or this life, I have glimpses of what you're talking about as being mm -hmm. as being a land of rest, as being a mm -hmm. a space of true energy and joy because I'm the, no longer no longer a practice in the sense of effort. and I have a desire for that. I also have a empathy or 
solidarity with my friends who are even farther away from that land for whom, Mm -hmm. you know, the one word, one phrase you said in there is it does take practice, but oddly, you know, it's like, I can kind of sense the, the practice is not increasing effort. It's more like the practice is letting go that old fallen way of engaging and living in the reality of God's presence. There's a lot in there. I'm just, I guess all I'm saying is all the things you just said at my heart goes, yes, I want that. I know that mm-hmm. I'm not. And what I want is the rest that that is. And I know you're not saying work harder. <laughs> actually, actually work less. You know, I, yeah. I love the path. I love the passages, you know, in, in second Chronicles chapter 20, for example, that, that beautiful prayer of Jehoshaphat. He talks about Abraham as the friend of God. And when Jesus says to his disciples, you know, John 15, just before he's arrested and crucified and all that, he says, he's given them that beautiful passage about abiding. And then he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. He, this, this sense of friendship with God is such a contemplative experience. Mm-hmm. And that sense of living in that friendship is... I think for me, that's the experience of, of the contemplative life is living in the friendship with God, with Jesus. And I guess that's the way I, I experience and, and live in that. It's just this, this constant sense of friendship with God in whatever, whatever situation I'm in. So is it a trying harder, being better kind of a thing? I hope not. I think that this is a there's a there's a thread that I'm hearing through all of my conversations. And one of that one of the threads is Christian contemplation is not a method. It's not a it's not a prescription. Here's a prescribed form of behavior to do, and then you get the result. And what you just said to me is like that, the kind of the bow on top of that thread, it's the, it's ties it all off. It's like, well, of course not. If, if the contemplative life is friendship with Jesus and just being in that friendship all the time, well, that's why the Christian contemplation isn't some sort of prescribed action method that you can perform and get at the results because it's not, it's not really a action at all. It's a, state of being in friendship with Jesus. (laughs) Methods, though, have their place Mm. because they can, I don't just instantly slide into this friendship Mm. with Jesus place. Methods have a place in helping us move that direction. Techniques have a place. They, They have a role. But when we focus on the technique and perfecting the technique, we, that's, that's where we get off a little bit. We shift the metaphor a little. I studied music years ago before I moved into theology ministry and all of that. And my piano teacher, who was a really, she was, she was quite the teacher. She, she always made me play these scales and fingering exercises, you know, and I do all these things and she would just, you know, she would drill me on these things. And I would think, why do I have to play all these scales? Why do I have to play these Hannon and Cherney fingering exercises? It used to drive me crazy until you realize, well, these are the building blocks of making music. That if I want to truly make music, I need to train my fingers to work in a certain way. Well, we do the same thing in relationships, don't we? You know, if a relationship hits a bit of a, of a rough patch, what do we do? We go to a counselor and they say, okay, here are some skills in listening. And here are some skills in how do you talk to one another? so that you can actually have a healthy conversation. And they they give us techniques, but those techniques are intended to move us in a particular direction so that I listen 
better for the purpose of restoring relationship so that we can communicate from the heart to another person. So techniques have their, have their place, but we wanna move beyond the scales and we wanna make music. And that's where we get to that place of that deepening friendship with Jesus. But there are some techniques that, you, that help us along the way. That is very helpful analogy. That is very helpful to me. Thank you for that. I am going to have to wrap us up here. We've, you have been a wealth of information and knowledge and wisdom, and I'm grateful for your taking the time mm -hmm. to speak with me about all this stuff. Thank you. You're welcome. It's been, it's been delightful. And uh, I feel like we scratched the surface. There's plenty more we could talk about, but, but I hope that's been helpful. Yeah. It has been. And yes, we did. <laughs> I find myself getting into these conversations and thinking I could go for another two or three hours. But Dr. Kimber, thank you for taking the time. And to our listeners, may the grace of Christ go with you wherever the road takes you. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to visit us at signpostend.org. While you're there, sign up for our e-newsletter and we'll send you a free ebook. Also, a big thanks to all of our supporters. Signpost N is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry, and we exist only because of our generous donors who make everything we do possible. Please consider supporting us with your recurring donation. Visit signpostin.org slash donate.